welcome. Welcome all those who are young, all those who are older, and especially you, right? We welcome you to Peter and the Wolf and other story music. You have just heard from most of our Aspen winds. Another round of applause for them. That particular piece is from Motion, called Tiptoe, arranged by Alyssa Morris. But it is time to fly away with Mother Goose tonight. For we know that Maurice Ravel created the Mother Goose Suite. Now within that, there are four story scenes. And so this is how it will be. We will have a story scene and then song. Story scene, song. Story scene, song. Story scene, song. And so if you could hold your applause until we have all eight pieces together right at the end of the music with Beauty and the Beast. But to start, to start we have Sleeping Beauty. In the distance, the prince could see two towers as they hung there up above the trees. He was out hunting, but never in this area, and he had to see for himself. As he crawled and crept and walked closer, he came upon these briars and brambles all about this kingdom, and he reached out his hand, but it cut him, and at that moment, the briars and the brambles magically pulled open. And the prince stepped forward. And then behind him, the briars and brambles closed. Now instead of having fear in his heart, this only made the prince more curious. He was now apart from his hunting party, but he pressed forward. And still, the briars and the brambles would part for him, until he looked down on the ground and there were these men and women and children and animals all strewn about, but they were not dead. They still had color. And then the tallest of those two towers was close enough for him to ascend those stairs and opened up into a huge room. There was a beautiful woman lying upon a bed. It was woven with gold and silver, the last gift that the king and queen could give their daughter. For as the whole kingdom for a hundred years had fallen asleep with Sleeping Beauty, the king and queen still had to live on. Someone had to look over the land. The prince saw that the cheeks of this beautiful maiden, this, no, this angel, looked like carnations, her lips the color of coral. And he bent down and kissed, and her eyes opened.
we have Tom Thumb. He was wandering about in circles in that forest, wondering where he should go. He had six other brothers counting on him. And even though they were lazy, they put all the work to him. Even though he was as small as a thumb, they called him Tom Thumb. This plan had worked before, though. The other night, when he had overheard mother and father say, that there was not enough food to feed all these mouths. Tom Thumb ran with those little feet of his to the edge of the river, and he gathered white pebbles, and he tossed them behind him as father led all the boys deep into the forest. That way they could find their way home again. But this time in the morning, when Tom Thumb overheard mother and father say once again they'd have to place the boys in the forest, all Tom Thumb could reach for was some bread, and he tossed out those crumbs. But high in the sky, circling around, were those birds, and they swooped down and ate those crumbs almost as if they were laughing at Tom Thumb. If only Tom Thumb knew what would happen next. If only he knew about the ogres. Then came Empress of the Pagodas. She stepped into that bath. Those wide waters, how they soothed her skin. 
and she felt like the most beautiful woman in the world. It was a feeling she had not felt for so long, because ever since she was born, there was a fairy who was not invited to the christening, and she was so angry that she cursed the empress to be the ugliest woman in the world. And as the empress grew older and older, she felt so much shame that one day she ran. She ran towards the ocean, and there she saw a boat. She climbed into that boat, and she sailed. But soon the clouds gathered above her, and the waves tossed to and fro, until at any moment the empress knew that she would fall over and never be seen again. And then from one of those waves came a green serpent, so huge, so hideous, that she covered her face. But the green serpent called out to her, I will save you, please, let me save you. And she looked at this creature, no, I would rather welcome death. And she closed her eyes. But when she opened her eyes, she was then in this garden with that beautiful bath. She did not know how she got there. So she stepped into that bath, those wide waters. And then from some of the bushes came the pagodas. They were these strange creatures about the size of four fingers and some as long as half an arm. And they were made out of all kinds of metals from gold and silver and crystal and diamonds. And they sang and they played their instruments. One of them even had a lute made from a walnut shell. And the stories they told, oh, the stories they told. Thank you. 
final story, Beauty and the Beast. The beast gazed into the eyes of Beauty way down at the end of the table that was decorated with delicacies from around the world. But the beast was not hungry. There were many questions in his mind, one of most importance. But the one that came out was, Beauty, how did you like the castle today? Beauty knew this was the question he always asked every day and every week and every month. And she told him, I found more rooms in your castle. One of them, I walked in, and I, I couldn't believe it. It was a whole library, so many books. There is not a chance I could read all of them in my lifetime. And then there was another room, all filled with mirrors. How beautiful. And the gardens, the fragrance of those roses. You take good care of this place. But Beauty knew there was another question coming. And she listened. Beauty, will you marry me? It was such an awkward feeling for Beauty. She knew that this was a kind and gentle creature. But every night she had these dreams. She had these dreams of a handsome prince, such a mysterious man. That was who she wanted to marry. And throughout the castle, she would find paintings of that exact prince from her dreams as if she was living her dream. And then she would look at the beast. And her answer was the same as before. No. No, I will not marry you. But in that moment, Beauty felt something inside her stomach, not something wrong there in the castle, something wrong farther. And she told the beast. The beast got up and came back with a magic mirror and told Beauty she could look into it, ask to see anyone. And Beauty asked to see her father. And there was the image of her father. He was, he was ill. He was sick. Beauty wanted to go to him. The beast said yes, knowing that beauty would never come back in time before he died.
We have flown with Mother Goose, and now we must fly on, fly to Spain, for that is where our next piece comes from, Ferdinand the Bull. You may know it as that classic picture book that was written by Monroe Leaf, but he wrote it because he had an illustrator friend, Robert Lawson, who had such a skill, he had to write it. And this arrangement is created by Mark Fish. Once upon a time in Spain, there was a little bull, and his name was Ferdinand. All the other little bulls he lived with would run. And jump. and butt their heads together. But not Ferdinand. He liked to sit just quietly and smell the flowers. He had a favorite spot out in the pasture under a cork tree. It was his favorite tree. And he would sit in its shade all day and smell the flowers. his mother, who was a cow, would worry about him. She was afraid he would be lonesome all by himself. Why don't you run and play with the other little bulls and skip and butt your head, she would say. But Ferdinand would shake his head. I like it better here where I can sit just quietly and smell the flowers. His mother saw that he was not lonesome, and because she was an understanding mother, even though she was a cow, she let him just sit there and be happy. As the years 
years went by. Ferdinand grew and grew until he was very big and strong. All the other bulls he had grown up with him in the same pasture would fight each other all day. They would butt each other and stick each other with their horns. What they wanted most of all was to be picked to fight at the bullfights in Madrid. But not Ferdinand. He still liked to sit just quietly under the cork tree and smell the flowers. One day, five men came in very funny hats. To pick the biggest, fastest, roughest bull to fight in the bullfights in Madrid. All the other bulls ran around snorting and butting, leaping and jumping. So the men would think that they were very, very strong and fierce and pick them. Ferdinand knew that they wouldn't pick him, and he didn't care. So he went out to his favorite court tree to sit down. He didn't look where he was sitting. And instead of sitting on the nice, cool grass in the shade, he sat on a bumblebee. Well, if you were a bumblebee and a bull sat on you, what would you do? You would sting him. And that is just what this bee did to Ferdinand. <laughs> Did it hurt? Fernand jumped up with a snort. He ran around puffing and snorting, butting and pawing the ground as if he were crazy.
the five men saw him. And they all shouted with joy. Here was the largest and fiercest bull of all, just the one for the bullfights in Madrid. So they took him away for the bullfight day in a cart. day it was. Flags were flying, bands were playing, and all the lovely ladies had flowers in their hair. They had a parade into the bull ring. with ribbons on them to stick in the bull and make him mad. Next came the picadores, who rode skinny horses and they had long spears to stick in the bull and make him madder. Then came the matador, the proudest of them all. He thought he was very handsome and bowed to the ladies. He had a red cape and a sword and was supposed to stick the bull last of all.
Then came the bull. And you know who that was, don't you? Ferdinand. They called him Ferdinand the Fierce. And all the banderilleros were afraid of him, and the picadores were afraid of him, and the matador was scared stiff. Fernand ran to the middle of the ring. And everyone shouted and clapped because they thought he was going to fight fiercely. And butt and snort and stick his horns around. But not Ferdinand. When he got to the middle of the ring, he saw the flowers and all the lovely ladies' hair, and he just sat down quietly and smelled. He just sat and smelled. And the banderilleros were mad. And the picadores were madder. And the matador was so mad, he cried, because he couldn't show off with his cape and sword. So they had to take Ferdinand home. still under his favorite cork tree smelling the flowers just quietly He is very happy.
for this next piece. We will be flying from Spain to Russia, which means that our ensemble must fly themselves. And as they go back behind, they'll come back. We'll get to Russia. But before that, I would like to have our, one of our ushers come, because we have our drawing. And that will give our ensemble the time that they need. Now, can we have some uh, rolling of drums? Okay, now we have two CDs, so there are two winners. <laughs> oh, come on, a little bit louder, come on, come on. Ah, ha, ha. there we go. And the winner, the first winner is Olivia Vota. Come on down, come on down. You have won the single CD of Motion, which you heard earlier today, and that is out there when we're done. But congratulations. Yes, you're a winner too. <laughs> Wonderful. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Drum roll, please. Drum roll. A little bit louder. This is the final one. Come on, you can do it. And the winner is... Wait, this is the same family. Is that all right? I think it should be a different family. Is that all right? Okay, just checking. Okay, drum roll again, drum roll again. The winner is Travis Wiley. Woo, all right, come on down. And you have won one of my storytelling CDs that is with other storytellers, Utah Stories. And that is, of course, also out there. But of course, you want to stay in your seats for this moment, right? Where are we traveling to? Russia. Thank you very much. Let's give her applause, too. This is serious stuff, so I must take a drink. Now we will do the classic, Peter and the Wolf. That classic one by Sergei Prokofiev. And each of the characters in this story is represented by an instrument. And the bird is represented by the flute, played by Lisa Whatcott. <laughs> the duck is represented by the oboe played by Stephanie Simper. <laughs> the cat, represented by the clarinet, played by Amy Gapitas. Grandfather is represented by the bassoon, played by Jessica Miller. You're coming, right, Grandpa? You want me to go all the way over there? <laughs> it, it needs some help. Maybe as an audience, we need to breathe in and out for Grandpa. <sighs> okay. I just got my new hip put in. <laughs> Just in time for tonight. Thank you, Grandpa. Maybe we need to start doing some count. And a one, and a two, and a one, and a two, 
You're almost there, Grandpa. And a one. And a two. Come on. And a one. And a two. And a one. And a two. You made it, Grandpa. Oh. Oh, oh. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Well, what are you guys all doing here? I think we... It is. It is about you, Grandpa. It is. Thank you, Grandpa. Oh. And deep in the woods, we have the wolf represented by the horn, played by Kit Weber. See if you can hear him deep in the woods. And Peter, since he is such an energetic boy, is represented by the ensemble. And we shall give them applause. Yes. And now to start the story. Peter and the wolf. Early one morning, Peter opened the gate and walked out on a big green meadow. On the branch of a big tree sat a little bird. All is quiet, chirped the bird gaily. Soon a duck came waddling around. She was glad that Peter had not closed the gate and decided to take a nice swim in the deep pond in the meadow. and shrugged her shoulders. What 
kind of bird are you if you can't fly, she said. To this the duck replied, what kind of bird are you if you can't swim, and dived into the pond. Suddenly, something caught Peter's attention. He noticed a cat crawling through the grass. The cat thought, the bird is busy arguing. I'll just grab her. Stealthily, she crept towards her on her velvet paws. Grandpa came out. He was angry because Peter had gone to the meadow. It is a dangerous place. If a wolf would come out of the woods, then what would you do? Peter paid no attention to grandfather's words. Boys as he are not afraid of wolves. But Grandfather took Peter by the hand, led him home, and closed the gate. No sooner had Peter left when a big gray wolf came out of the forest. In a twinkling, the cat climbed up the tree. The duck quacked and in her excitement jumped out of the pond.
But no matter how fast the duck ran, she could not escape the wolf. He was getting nearer, 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 nearer. Until he got her and with one gulp swallowed her down. Now this is how things stood. The cat sitting on one branch, the bird on another, not too close to the cat. The wolf prowled around the tree, looking up at them with greedy eyes. In the meantime, Peter, without fear, behind that gate, watched carefully. He ran home, took a strong rope, and climbed the high stone wall. One of the branches hung over that wall where that wolf prowled. And Peter climbed that tree and then sent Bird to fly and distract the wolf. Peter made a lasso and carefully letting it down caught the wolf by the tail and pulled with all his might. Feeling himself caught, the wolf jumped wildly. Peter took one end of that rope and tied it to the tree. And the wolf kept jumping tighter and tighter, the rope around his tail. Just then, some hunters came out of the woods following the wolf's trail. <laughs> But Peter, sitting in the tree, cried, Don't shoot! Bertie and I have already caught the wolf. Now help us take him to the zoo. If you listen carefully, you can still hear the duck quacking inside the wolf. Thank you so much.
We thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience.